we pray. We thank you, O oh God, for the majesty of this moment, for the sweetness of this hour, for your grace, for your mercy, for your truth and justice. Now there are no words in my tongue that thou dost not know all together. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. To President Thomas, to the distinguished brothers and sisters who are present, to Chairman Willie Woods, to this formidably august collection of preachers, thinkers, and doers that sit on this pulpit too numerous to name President Franklin, President Kimbrough, the Moss Trio, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Professor Eddie Gloud, Delman Coates, Reverend Dr. Professor Coates, and so many other distinguished men who are here today. To you, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, good afternoon. Good afternoon. good afternoon. And to the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Carter, the great and visionary figure who occupies this space, we say a hearty hello. And to my man, Brother Good Game, as well. Now, it is such a distinguished honor uh, to be here this afternoon, but you see this all-star lineup behind me. And in Utah this weekend, they're going to have the NBA all-star game. Now, y'all know any of these preachers and thinkers back here could as easily stand here as I stand here. I try to convince three or four of them to take my place, but they all deferred. So I am left with the obligation to stand here on this Cornell Everett Talley, Calvin Otis Butts pulpit. I was born in Detroit and reared there and heard the great preaching of Cornell Talley. And I preached several times at Abyssinian Baptist Church under the invitation of Dr. Butts. I first met Dr. Butts formally. I had known him, gone to the church, starting as a graduate student before he even became pastor. But I got to know him formally when Vibe Magazine assigned me the story to write about this New York minister who was steamrolling the CDs of Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> I know you Generation Zs don't know for shizzle my nizzle. <laughs> Y'all stuck on future. Parenthetically, how did Rolling Stone put Gucci Mane on the top 50 but left off Big Boy? Wow. Wow. Uh-huh, hush that fuzz. Everybody move to the back of the bus. Do you want to bump or slump with us? We the type of people make the party get crunk. Kendrick Lamar, number two, ahead of Nas. Yeah. 
It's only right that I was born to use mics and the stuff that I write is even tougher than dice. I'm taking rap into a new plateau through rap slow. My rhyming is a vitamin hell without a capsule. Back to the lecture at hand. And so they assigned me the story to talk about him, but I'm an ordained Baptist preacher. I wasn't going to write no slander about no Baptist preacher. Now, we, we butted heads. We talked at length about our conceptions of hip hop culture. And finally, the magazine didn't run the story because it wasn't a hatchet job or a head job. It was an appreciation for the complicated and nuanced interpretation of black youth culture at a moment of crisis in American society. And so I'm honored to be here this morning, this afternoon, in the Cornell Tally Calvin Butts pulpit. I want to turn your attention to the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and I'll read you from the sixth down through the eleventh verses. And there you discover these words, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now for a very few moments, I want to reflect with you on the subject, Stay Woke. Thomas Jefferson said of the sleep gap between African Americans and Caucasian Americans that it was an index of our innate inferiority because after a long day's work, we fell into sleep quite rapidly. Now, in his mind, it ain't got nothing to do with the back-breaking work that we were doing. It was an index of the inherent inferiority of the Negro intellect. Because white folk, he said, could stay awake for many hours and engage in rational reflection. Of course, we have to take Mr. Jefferson with a grain of salt in that same arena of reflection, he said in Notes on Virginia that Negroes didn't have good harmony. Was he not listening to Destiny's Child or the Supremes? Even then, on many a slave encampment, the harmonious echo of eternity resonated in the breasts and throats of those who were enslaved. And then a Louisiana physician said, Brother Wainwright, that, that black people suffered from a peculiar 
inclination to fall asleep. Dysathesia Ethiopica. Oh, they will come up with some words <laughs> to call out what they think of as Negro liabilities projected against the backdrop of their own white supremacist ignorance and interior reflection on their own incapacity. Dysesthesia Ethiopica, they said, was the peculiar Negro trait of falling to sleep to indicate again that we were fundamentally inferior and therefore in need of more work. It was Frederick Douglass who said that more slaves, to quote him, were punished for oversleeping than for any other fault. As a result of this, it astonishes me that the present cultural elite and political order are so addicted to falling asleep. White folk who used to look upon Negroes as inherently inferior for going to sleep now want to stay asleep because they got a war on wokeness. These sycophantic synambulists, these seductive street and sleepwalkers who have told us for centuries that the Negro capacity for oversleep not as an indictment of white supremacy, not as an indictment of vicious inimical forces unleashed on the vulnerable bodies of black folk, not as a result of being overworked, but because it is a reflection of our inherent inferiority, they've been telling us that to be sleep is a problem, but now all they can celebrate is remaining asleep while we're trying to stay woke. Now, woke has become a pejorative term. I know y'all know about that, y'all Morehouse men. You know what it is. You read your lessons. You read the newspapers. You read Instagram. You check out social media. You know what's going on. You know what's happening. The Bible says to us in this passage, don't listen to these empty words of Ron DeSantis in Florida. And Ron DeSantis signed literally an anti-woke bill. They want to legislate against being made aware. Again, I'm confused. They are banning books. But they said Negroes couldn't read. So what you banning, what we can't read. Won't you just leave it open? Because you used to say if you want to hide something from a Negro, put it in a book. Were they lying? <laughs> Did they acknowledge that the reason they could hide it in the book, not because we didn't have a desire for literacy, which has impelled us forward from the beginning of our sojourn on these shores, it was because they restricted us from reading and we paid a vicious price in our flesh if we desired to read. But Frederick Douglass said, reading unfits a child for slavery. George Clinton put it this way, free your mind and your behind will follow. And so now we've got a governor in Florida who is legislating against telling the truth about the American past, doesn't want you to read books doesn't want you to engage in critical reflection upon your own culture, doesn't want you to understand that slavery was part and parcel of what it means to be an American, that black contributions through Jan Matt Zelliger and the shoe lasting machine and Deadwood Dick as a cowboy and Mary McLeod Bethune as an educator, on and on and on, but their empty words, their skullduggery, their numb scullery, 
their nincompoopery, <laughs> their tomfoolery. There are other words to be called, but outside the realm of the religious, we shall evoke them subsequently. <laughs> and so, my brothers and sisters, here is a governmental act proscribing the ability of people to engage in literate reflection upon the history of this nation. Why is that a problem? Because America's democracy cannot survive if you ain't reading. If you and I don't read. Now, black folk are known to read each other. <laughs> read a situation. And yet here we are with an impulse to remain awake, to tell the truth about America, but we have white supremacists in high places who do not want us to know the truth of our history. That's why American democracy rests upon the tongues and the talent of black people. Without us, American democracy would not be real. Nicole Hannah Jones wrote about it by saying American democracy wasn't real until black folk got involved. Dr. King said, it will be the Negro who injects meaning into the veins of Western civilization. Dr. King said, we ought to remain awake through a great revolution. So we got the same white folk that used to say we were sleeping, who's sleeping on us. We got the same white folk now who are running government, who are trying to ruin government. They don't want you to know your ABCs of what and who we are because America would not be America without us. <laughs> Ralph Ellison said, what would America be without the Negro? What would America be without James Baldwin? Your alumnus, Professor Gloud, wrote a brilliant book, Began Again, about James Baldwin, that pint-sized prophet, that deeply intellectual reflector upon the existential chaos of black being, that black man who lifted up the possibility of our infinite recreation through the lens of his own body. That black man made America what it is today. When, when we think about what America would be without Sarah Vaughan, without Ella Fitzgerald. What would America be without old dirty bastard? <laughs> Me and Mariah go back like babies and pacifiers. Yes, the guttermost unto the othermost. The lumpen proletariat, the radically black poor, those who are marginalized, those who have no power to stand within the context of African-American culture, those of us who limit them, they will continue to define what America is. America would not be America without black people's genius contributing to this nation. Now we know there's a limit on them, they're empty words. They might give Beyonce the Grammy for dance music, but they ain't gonna give her the Grammy for best record of the year. <laughs> I'm not here to defend Queen B. I'm not here to show my beehive card. <laughs> I'm not here begging for one of the concert tickets that may be available in somebody's mailbox right now. Holler at your boy afterward. But I'm here to say that as long as you are ghettoized, you're fine. But when you attempt to transcend the lethal limits and the brutal barriers that are imposed upon us, then we are seen as a problem. And so the Bible reminds us that the empty words, and we know these empty words didn't start with Ron DeSantis. We had an orange apparition cloud the horizon of American democracy. This man stood up every morning to excrete the feces of his moral depravity into a nation he turned into his psychic commode. This man was proud of his ignorance. He knew 25 to 27 words. 
bad, sad, see Dick run. And yet, another president before him, and no matter what criticisms we have, and we should have many, what we understand about that man is that he was literate. He read entire books. He talked to people in full sentences. He was capable of intellectual engagement at the highest order. What would America be without us? Stay woke. Awaken yourself to your tradition. But the Bible warns us, don't you become partners with them. And some of us are partners in policing blackness in our own culture. We saw what happened the other day in Memphis. Five black men murdered a black man for no reason, certainly no good reason. And yet that is a metaphor for what we do to each other on the regular, hating on each other. One black man sees another black man, can't acknowledge his genius, as if acknowledging his genius takes away from your genius. If you are a Mo House man, the more in the house is better. Yeah. It does no disservice for the great Reverend Dr. Otis Moss Jr. to recognize the genius of his son, Otis Moss III. They both geniuses in their own right, in their own style. I know it's their own style, but allow me an abundant-sized articulation during Black History Month. It does no disservice for Delman Coates with his New Testament PhD to acknowledge the genius of Eddie Gloud with his PhD in religion, ethics, and politics, one from Columbia, the other from Princeton, both from Morehouse. Because to acknowledge another's genius is to acknowledge the God who gave us the breath to be inspired in the first place. But some of us who have been victims of white supremacy and police brutality, let's be honest about that. We see that America is being over-policed and those of us who are God's children of chocolate origin are especially over-policed. And so we've got to tell the truth about that. But we've got to tell the truth about how we over-police each other ourselves. The way we think and talk and speak and smell, the way we get up in the morning, what group we belong to, what society we are a part of. We are part of being black in America. That thing is deep and dense and specific and nuanced and universal and particular and beautiful at all stops. I was preaching the other day at a church in Cleveland. Shouldn't have said that, but I've already done it. Black woman came up to me after service and said, you know you're going to hell. I said, ma'am, did you speak to Jesus this morning because I spoke to him and no flames were mentioned. She said, don't be smart. You know what I'm talking about. I said, ma'am, I do. I know 25 reasons why I should go to hell. I'm just curious, which of those reasons do you know? She said, you said from the pulpit that God created gay people. I said, ma'am, and you think I'm going to hell? Because you're clearly a polytheist. You think there's a God for straight people and one for gay. Ain't but one God. Either God created everybody or God ain't created nobody. I said, it ain't like God took off on Wednesday and said, it's hard creating these human beings. And the God of the second shift got on board and then created gay people. That's the same thing white Christian nationalists said about you in the creation of black folk in America. My brothers, don't partner with these white supremacists who speak in black skin, 
You saw this during the run for the Senate here in Georgia. You know that white supremacy can have a ventriloquist effect. Black mouth moving, white supremacist ideas rolling forth. And so, do not partner with those who would police black folk rhetorically, who would police us spiritually, who would attempt to tell us what blackness is and defining it in narrow terms. I'm 64 years old, and the older I get, the more I discover I don't know about the very blackness of which I am a notable participant. And I say to you, keep on studying, keep on staying awake, don't be lured to sleep, don't sleep on your job, understand what it means to be a black man in America. And I know it's very difficult. They hating on us and mad at us because as uh, was mentioned by Chairman Woods, Calvin Butts had swag. A lot of y'all got swag. There are swag haters out here in America. They mad because the way you talk, you ain't got no money in the bank. You ain't even got your degree yet, but you got skill. You got possibility. You got charisma. You got magic. And don't let a black man get a little piece of money and a little piece of car and a little piece of degree and stand up with the integrity of God. That swagaliciousness is undeniable. Black men. Just the way we talk, just the way we say baby, just the way we summons those whom we love. We ain't got to grab it. We ain't got to take it. We've got to anal analyze our possibility in light of what we have to offer and then offer the possibility of reciprocity as the basis of our affection. My point simply is to be a black man is both a deadly preoccupation in America and the most beautiful contemplation of possibility that we can conjure. And so I say to you as I end, don't partner with those who would teach you not to love your own, who would teach you not to embrace your own, who would teach you not to swing wide the doors of your mind, to accept the fullness of this blackness, Tupac said, somebody wake me, I'm dreaming. I started as a sea, the seaman, swimming upstream, planted in the womb while screaming. On the top was my pops, my mama hollering stop from a single drop. This is what they got? Not to disrespect my people, but my papa was a loser. Only plan he had for mama was the blinker and abuser. And even as a seed, I could see his plan for me, stranded on welfare, another broken family. This is living inside the cosmic trauma of black denial at the moment that black people refuse to love each other. Because without money in the bank, our love was able to sustain a nation. Without capacity to get educated, we were able to make do and transform the world so that our children became educated and we changed this world. And so as I take my seat, stay woke, stay alert, but sleep when necessary. And see, the white supremacists want you to be asleep when you should be wide awoke. They want you to go to bed when you should be on your job. Ron DeSantis or, or your governor here in Georgia. Here they are knowing that Donald Trump tried to manipulate an election the Secretary of State refused to go along, but then subsequently they denied the legitimacy of the claim that they were trying to deny democracy. On January 6th, a bunch of disgruntled folk, mostly white brothers and sisters, were trying to overturn an election because they are sleepwalking through American democracy. And you must remain awake as soldiers of transformation so that America can become fully what it ought to be. Yeah. But then, get your sleep. One of the things that has marked radical inequality in America 
is the sleep patterns of black folk. We don't get much sleep because we have been made to stay awake, to watch over in a paranoid reflection of what could potentially roll up on us. But accept the gift of sleep when God gives it and when we create enough racial equality in order to enjoy it. There was a man, I know you've heard this story, who applied for a job on a farm. He wanted to be a farmhand and the farmer was interviewing all these folk and he finally got to this young man, he said, what's your qualification? He said, I can sleep through a storm. He thought that was weird. What does that have to do with taking care of the cows and the pigs and the chickens? But he said, I'm gonna take a chance on him. He looks like a Morehouse man. And then one day, the storms came and he wanted to batten down the hatches. He wanted to get everything straight. He wanted to make sure that his chickens were secured and that his pigs were taken care of and that the horses were, were taken care of, but the young man was asleep, true to his word. It was storming outside and this young boy was asleep. And the farmer was so disappointed, he tried to wake him and he would not wake up. He tried to shake him and he would not wake up. He was in a deep REM sleep. And finally the man gave up and he said, I've got to save the farm myself. And so he went out there and to his great surprise, the chickens had been put in their coop, the pigs in their sty, the horses in their grazing barns and the ability of the farm to survive was secured. And when the boy woke up, it became apparent to him the reason he could sleep through a storm is that before the storm came, he was prepared for what would occur. I know y'all know what I'm talking about. Be prepared so that when the storm comes, you got your degree. You got your investment. You got your education. You've got your family. You've got your love. You've got your relationship with a higher being. You've got your stuff together so that when the storm comes, you can lay your head down and rest on the beauty of God. Peace.